respond to that and I'll send it around the, uh, uh, tomorrow or next week. Uh, and also some exciting news. So we are putting together a conference, an open science conference in June. Uh, it's going to either be the 10th or the 11th of June and we have uh, several speakers lined up for that too. So uh, put that in your diaries and we will distribute material about that as well anyway. So I'll hand you over to Dr. Ewan Carr. So Ewan is in the biostats department uh, and he works with all sorts of um, different sets of techniques as you sh should uh, be able to know from his, uh, he's one of the stats advisory people. But he has a very keen interest in R and Python, so he's one of the, the good guys I think, uh, <laughs> moving away from SPSS. And today he's going to talk to us about a wonderful thing called R Markdown, which is the best gift one can give at Christmas time. <laughs> so, you and I'll hand it over to you. Uh, this is, yes, this is recording. So, I'll just nip out and put that. So, can you take it away? Yeah. So, hi. Um, um, I think I've met some of you before, but yeah, I'm based over in the main building. Um, uh, and uh, amongst other sorts of research, we also teach statistical programming and uh, R. Sometimes they can talk about things like our markdown. So it's the next sort of 40 minutes or so, uh, or however long uh, you let me talk for, uh, is um, hopefully going to be interesting for people who have never used our markdown before, but hopefully also for people who have maybe tried it a bit um, and maybe want to take it further and want to see what else is possible. Um, I should add a question mark to the making of your computer. We'll, we'll see by the end. Um, so the general premise of what I'm talking about today and what our markdown is, um, is a sort of synthesis of your analysis and your reporting uh, into a single document and a single sort of workflow. Um, so on the left-hand side, we might have a more traditional approach where we carry out our analysis uh, in whatever that package you like, maybe R, maybe uh, Stata, SSS. Um, but we do the analysis, we stop, we save the results, then we open Microsoft Word, we start typing, we copy things over, um, and then we change something in our analysis, we copy it all back over again, and our data changes, and we maybe copy it again. Um, and we go back and forth, and eventually we end up with some final document. Um, so that's what we've been mostly doing uh, up until now. Uh, and what we're aiming for instead is sort of a more integrated approach where we uh, are combining both of these steps at once. Uh, so that's the aim, that's the promise. Um, what is our markdown? So our markdown is um, software for for carrying out this sort of streamlined approach where we, we give it our, our data and our code, we hit a, a button somewhere in our studio, and out we get is uh, documents, HTML files, uh, PDFs, whatever you like. Uh, and so hopefully today we're gonna sort of slightly unpack the, this black box of what is actually going on. Uh, it can get surprisingly complex in terms of um, the different bits of software that are sort of speaking to each other to, to make this all work. Um, but hopefully that'll be a bit clearer by the time I finish. Um, and uh, I should add, that I'll, I'll try and leave some time at the end for questions if you have like, specifics um, about how any of this works. Okay, so why, first of all, before we sort of get into the details, why, what's the point in all this? Why are we here? Um, so an earlier uh, riot talk, uh, was introduced to a very nice paper, uh, five selfish reasons to work reproducibly, which included things like uh, easier to write papers to um, help people see it your, your way, continuity, lots of good things that um, we get out of it. Um, and so I thought maybe we can try and have you know, five things, um, five reasons why you might want to think about automating your reporting. Uh, and so the sort of biggest and the, the sort of first on this list is definitely going to be reproducibility. Um, so we want to uh, share our code, our data with someone, and they can hit the same button that we did and they can see how all of those results were generated. They can zoom in on a particular number in the, in, the, in the paper or in the report, and they can see exactly how that was calculated and where the data came from. Uh, and the entire sort of chain of evidence um, is clear and transparent. So uh, maybe in some sort of idealized future scenario, so at the minute when we go to a journal page, and uh, we can see we can do lots of things, but one of them, we can download a PDF. Um, and what I was wondering, maybe in the future, it'd be nice if we can add another button in there, which would be run analysis. And, and the ideal here would be that this would, um, by uploading, uh, for example, an R markdown file, but it doesn't matter, by uploading our code and our data to the journal, 
Um, this would make it entirely transparent and would allow readers to potentially run the analysis in the browser uh, and see what happens. This, I think we're some way off this, and especially from big journals, but um, this is, I think, the, the dream. This is like, what ideally we'd like to see, is complete transparency, and our markdown is, a, is one way of getting there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I've already said that one. Um, in addition to sort of transparency to um, the wider audiences, it's also really helpful to share with collaborators um, our markdown documents that show what you did. So um, you can send a quick sort of initial analysis that contains um, some sort of preliminary results, but also the code for those results. Um, and, and so you're sort of, you can um, yeah, show, show what you did and, and why. Um, efficiency. Um, this can save time. I've got some other caveats in a moment about time, but for now, let's say that it, it can save time. Um, and especially in um, documents that are, um, or sort of rather where you have data that is changing very often, and you need to quickly regenerate that report each time, each time the data changes, um, it is far more efficient to write something once and sort of hit the button over and over as data changes with, without the copying and pasting um, that we'd otherwise have to do. So uh, laziness, efficiency, however you want to phrase it, um, definitely something uh, we care about. Um, and consistency. Um, as I said before, what we would normally do is, is some degree of copying and pasting. We might sort of make data or get data to generate uh, a CSV file, and then we go and sort of hand edit the CSV file and then we copy it into our Word. Some, some manual process where every time we do it, there's a non-zero chance of us making a mistake, and the more times we do it, we're definitely going to make a mistake. Uh, so um, maybe by writing dynamic reporting, by using dynamic, dynamic reporting, we can avoid um, these types of errors. Um, however, and I want to sort of like, temper the uh, excitement for this with sort of some reality. Um, this is a well-known XKCD comic, sort of highlighting the problem of, I guess, automating things too soon, um, uh, and the idea that um, sort of the, the promise of automation is sometimes not uh, connected to the reality of actually doing it. And, and so um, what I think I'm going to sort of uh, warn against is um, if you're looking for sources of procrastination, if you're really trying to avoid writing your thesis, uh, if you come to the right place, um, you can definitely lose a lot of time doing this. Uh, and so I would probably try and say, use this in a productive way. Uh, and I'll say more about this as I go through. Um, things like, uh, to, to, com to completely automate a final polished document might take a, a lot of work, but you can get 95% of the way there with half the work or a quarter of the work. And so try and, um, uh, I guess, yeah, keep in mind what the aim is. If, and I'll talk about this in, in a moment, if the aim is reproducibility to make you completely invested, that loop, sort of syncing this time up front is worth it because um, it is sort of philosophically important to, to use, uh, to have reproducible reports. Uh, but if you're really interested in sort of the laziness angle, uh, then maybe keep in mind um, this sometimes will take longer because, um, yeah, for various reasons. Okay, so, so why, why shouldn't you use our markdown? Um, and you can leave after this slide, it's fine. Um, so why we don't care about reproducibility or transparency? I think it's unlikely for a riot. Uh, event, so uh, I think most of you are already um, hopefully on board with point number one. Um, quite more seriously, um, your data never change. So you have one set of data, I guess data and analysis never change. Um, uh, and, it, and even worse, if, your, if the format of your figures and tables change very often. Uh, so we often find, for example, when we're reporting on trials, Trials are a quite nice example because in theory everything should be standardized and you decide up front how you're going to report things and then as more data comes in for different, um, uh, different commit uh, committees and different reports, the idea will be we just sort of press a button and get a new report as we have more data. Um, what actually happens is that people change their minds about what tables they want and where they want them and, and how they want them to be laid out. And every time they make a change, you have to go back and sort of automate that again. And so if you're working with, um, if you don't have control over the layout or, you, or things change very often, um, this can take up sort of even more time. Um, 
I said before that we can avoid copying and pasting um, and we can avoid some of the manual errors that come in from that. But on the other hand, we introduce a whole new type of errors, which would be systematic errors. So now, uh, if you have an error in your code, instead of just getting one of the cells wrong, your entire table is wrong, or the entire analysis is wrong. So we've, we've avoided one type of error, and we've, um, I suppose you, you, I guess you had that error already in your previous analysis, but it's just good to keep in mind, it's not magic. We can still make errors, and when we do, they're often harder to spot and um, systematic throughout your whole document. And lastly, why you might not want to do this is if you're writing a short document or it's something that's not going to be around for long. I generally will not bother with our markdown <coughs> if it's a quick report for colleagues. I'll just open a Word document and paste everything in. Um, it's better the longer you're working on that document. Um, I'll say more about that in a bit. Um, so today uh, I'm going to give an introduction to what is our markdown, what's happening when we use it. Uh, I'm going to give a sort of um, the essentials, I guess, um, the different bits of syntax that we need to use to write these documents and how they work. I'm going to go further with some details about um, other, um, other technologies or more advanced features that you may want to uh, use. And then I'm going to finish with some um, tips for um, doing this productively and also some sort of remaining things that are still hard that I don't think we have good answers for. Um, so there's quite a lot to cover, and um, I think the slides are definitely going to be circulated, and there are links throughout. So if I skip over things quickly, um, by all means, ask questions, I should say, do, do interrupt. Um, but hopefully there's enough links in here that you can always find things after we've asked you to get. Okay, so what is happening? So our markdown is just another in a long line of um, technologies for literate programmers. Um, and this um, started in I think, well, I don't actually know how far back it goes, definitely the 70s, um, at least. Uh, and and this, the idea, it's quite taken from Wikipedia, is that we're combining sort of paragraphs in, in English or whatever, whichever language you're using, um, interspersed with source code. Um, and, um, and it's this idea of mixing the reporting and the sort of code in one document. Um, there's been a number of different technologies, um, web, see web, no web, um, from the 80s onwards. Uh, SWE, some of you may have heard of, was for R, and this was, um, has been around for uh, almost 20 years now um, to produce uh, LaTeX documents from R. Um, and more recently, Jupyter Notebooks, if you use Python, you'll have seen those um, offer many of the sort of similar functionality in that we can produce documents, generate HTML um, sort of reports with those. Um, so our markdown is uh, just sort of another. Uh, another in a long line. Um, there are two main packages, I'm not going to say much about these because, to be honest, I, I forget the differences. Um, Nitter, I think, was around first, but I'm not entirely sure. This was developed by someone who's a PhD thesis for them, dynamic graphics and reporting for statistics. There's a website here, it's great. Uh, you should definitely have a look at Nitter. Uh, our markdown is developed by our studio. This person now works at our studio, so there's a whole lot of crossover. For now, don't worry about any of this. Do have a look at websites, they're really useful. Um, and later, though, if you sort of um, at first just use our studio, later you can have a look at these commands render and knit and maybe try and understand the differences. But they're both two packages that are using much of the same technology, um, just with slightly different interfaces. Okay, so what does it look like? Um, so on the screen is an R Markdown document. This is what you will write to generate your report. Uh, and there are a few things to highlight. So at the top, we have this header block. I'll say more about that later, but we put in here essential bits of information. Um, some of these are obvious, but also, for example, we're going to tell it what type of output do we want. In this case, we want an HTML document. Um, we then have in green here some text, um, and this is written in uh, Markdown syntax. And I'll say more about Markdown in a second, but you'll become very familiar writing Markdown um, as you use our, um, our Markdown, unsurprisingly. Um, the, 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 these blocks here, these chunks here, uh, are what we call code chunks, and these are blocks of our code um, that are going to be evaluated by R, and some representation of whatever this evaluates to is going to be inserted in your document. And I'll say more about that later. But this is essentially what you'll be writing. Uh, this is what it looks like. OK, 
Okay, so I just mentioned uh, Markdown. Uh, so Markdown started, I think, around 2004, originally as a way of um, making it easier to write documents for the web. So I think it was originally a Perl script that took this kind of syntax and produced HTML uh, for computers in 2004 onwards. Um, it has syntax for common things that you would want in a document. So uh, headings, uh, level one, level two, uh, bold, italics, figures, um, and all sorts of other things. Uh, our markdown is using uh, Pandoc. Remember this action, yes. Um, Pandoc is, uh, has also been around for a long time, is software for converting between different markup formats. Um, it is the reason, it's a thing that makes our markdown possible, and I don't think it gets enough credit. When people say R Markdown, what they really mean is they're using R and Pandoc and some sort of scripts to stick the two together. Um, so Pandoc is, um, is, a, is software that runs on just about any platform, and it can take, for example, um, a Word document and convert it to a PDF. It can take uh, Markdown and convert it to a PowerPoint document. In fact, I think down the bottom there's this giant... Um, it takes anything on the left and converts it to anything on the right, um, just about. Um, so you... What, as you use uh, our markdown, you are essentially going to become an expert using Pandoc. Uh, and that's what you're doing. And so when you are wondering sort of what, uh, what syntax can I use um, in, my, in my document, um, the place to come is, um, is the Pandoc website and sort of all of the um, details in here um, are what you want. Um, and so Pandoc allows us to take um, an R markdown document, or markdown, but in this case, R Markdown, and convert it to a Word document, to a PDF document, to HTML, to PowerPoint, or one of those other 50 other document types we just saw. These are the main ones that we're talking about. Um, so that's what we're using, that's what's happening. Um, okay, so, so what actually, what does this look like? So I'm gonna switch over, hopefully this works, yes? Okay, so hopefully everyone has used R or R Studio. If not, I apologize, um, you'll, you'll uh, quickly pick it up. Um, so, to get started, and if you've never used R Markdown before, I recommend you do this, go into our studio, create a new uh, R Markdown document, uh, we'll give it a name, um, we'll leave everything as default, so I'm just gonna uh, choose HTML output here, uh, I'm gonna save it, uh, report.rmd, uh, and then I'm gonna hit this button, knit, um, I think named after knitter, but, um, We'll let that run off of this thing, and then we get out the report. So that's it, that's, that's our markdown in a nutshell. Um, everything else I'm gonna say next is really gonna explain what just happened uh, and, and, and how we can sort of customize this and uh, make it well. But that's essentially what we're, what we're working with. Okay, so what, what did just happen? Um, so there's different pieces of technology that are making this all possible. I've already, already mentioned, or well, we know R, and I mentioned Nitra and R Markdown. Uh, I mentioned Pandoc, and under the hood, these are all sort of working together to generate your report or your HTML file or whatever it is. So if we're, if we're going from R Markdown to Word, what's happening is, so R Markdown is taking your RMD document, so you write your uh, R Markdown document, it um, evaluates all of the chunks of R code and replaces those chunks with markdown representations of your, uh, of your analysis. And we'll say a lot more about that in a second. Um, it passes over to Pandoc as, as markdown, and then Pandoc will do the conversion into a Microsoft Word document. So if, if we're going from R markdown to Word, there are sort of a few stages. Um, if you're using LaTeX, and if you don't know what LaTeX means, don't worry, it's a, um, it's a it's a language for uh, writing documents. It's been around forever, um, and it's sometimes useful. Um, for this, there's an additional step involved. We start with our R Markdown document. We do the same thing. R is going to run the code, uh, give us um, a Markdown document. We use Pandoc to convert that to LaTeX, and then we use LaTeX to convert that to a PDF. Uh, this all happens if you um, sort of choose PDF and then hit the button. And, and then sort of under the hood, it will run through all of these steps. Um, this, this can get really uh, convoluted 
And when something breaks, it's often very hard to know which bit is broken. Was it an error in my R code? Was it an error in my R markdown code? Is it something to do with the way the latex is being interpreted? So um, I don't really have any answer for sort of how to get around that, but um, yeah, it's start with Microsoft Word output. It's definitely easier than using latex. There's a, there are fewer steps and less to go wrong, but just be warned that you are gonna sort of become very good at debugging this long process of, um, of generating documents. Okay, so that's, um, that's what I'm gonna say there. Right, so now I'm gonna introduce some of the um, essential uh, syntax, explain how they work, um, uh, and hopefully this will give you sort of a starting point on how to create documents in our markdown. Okay, so the first thing that we can do is we can use inline R expressions. So what am I talking about? So we are able to, uh, in a paragraph of text, insert some R code that when we knit our document will be replaced with the evaluated, um, with that code having been evaluated. So in this sentence here, for example, um, we start with a back tick and we, we finish with a back tick. We start with the letter R to tell our markdown that this is um, some R code that we want to be evaluated. And then whatever comes afterwards is going to be sort of um, evaluated and replaced in the resulting document. So here there are 87 rows in this data set, so that will be updated. And here um, we're going to replace it with the mean of a particular column. Um, so this is um, very helpful. It's um, good for results sections. Um, it's good for uh, ensuring that the relevant sample size, or it's good for any number in your document that's going to change potentially. Um, and so when you, um, I don't know, make a small change to your analysis, you don't have to go and check all of the third decimal places in the entire results section um, or whatever um, in your document. You can be fairly creative with these inline expressions. Um, so often I will write functions to uh, quickly format numeric values. I don't want this to appear in my document, I really just want one decimal place. So I'll write a quick function to take a number and replace the uh, one decimal place um, representation of that. Um, going slightly further, we might have bits and models or a model, and we might have a table of coefficients from that model, as we've seen up here with some odd ratios and some 95% uh, confidence intervals. And I want to put these in my document, but I also want to uh, do it quickly. And so I might write a function like print odd, odd ratio that takes um, a column, a row, sorry, in this uh, uh, table here and prints out something that I'd want to see in my results section. Formatting the numbers and putting in the 95% CI and so on. And so you can save yourself a lot of typing um, by using functions to sort of automate repetitive um, inputs. Um, and to sort of uh, generalize this, essentially what we're seeing here, it's quite nice to write a report in a programming language. It's quite nice to be able to um, use a programming language to define things like maybe acronyms. I don't want to type out this whole long um, set of words each time. I also want to make sure that I'm using that, um, that acronym or that um, uh, phrase consistently throughout my document. So I could define it as a, uh, a, ver a variable here and just use it anywhere I like in the document. Um, similarly, if you want to keep track of tables, um, I have a, f a figure here that is um, showing some trajectories, um, and I can't, like, that might be figure one one week, and then next week it's figure two because we added a new figure. Um, I don't want to go through and change all of the references in my document. So you can do anything you like. Um, um, yeah, last, last examples, for example, it's good to often to report when the document was updated and which version of R you're using, then again, you just use R expressions for that. So, um, essentially what we're seeing here is inserting R code into your text to, that can be done actually updated, and that might be results, it might be uh, cross-references or anything else. Okay, so now going slightly further, we might also want to have chunks of R code that um, do other things, not just uh, in, in paragraphs themselves. So on the screen here, you can see the syntax for um, code chunks. Um, when we knit this document, R will evaluate anything inside the chunk and replace it with some representation. 
the main things to note here, we've got three back ticks to begin and end. We've got um, the letter R to tell um, our markdown that this is an R code chunk. We have an optional label, um, so it can help to um, label your chunks, maybe setup, maybe uh, analysis, or whatever you like. I don't always use them, but you can. And then there are a bunch of options that we can put after the comma, and I'll talk about those in a second. So here's what it looks like. Um, by default, our markdown is going to run this code and then just put whatever it gets as uh, uh, the output in terms of what you would normally see at the R console, it will just dump that into options. And normally that's not what you want. Um, and, and so and I'm going to stress this point that the hardest thing, probably, the hardest thing about our markdown is getting uh, markdown representations of your output. And we'll uh, uh, sort of show you in a moment what I mean by this. Uh, and so, um, yeah, right now, good. Uh, so here I uh, have a table. If you, we load the uh, Tidyverse package, and then it, we have this table available, which has got uh, six rows, four columns, and this is TB cases uh, around the world for different years. And I want this in my document. So uh, we might start, and we just start with a, a code chunk, and we just put the table in, nothing else. And what we get out is, is this mess which is what you'd see at the console, and that's completely fine when you're working interactively, but I don't want this in my document. Um, maybe then someone tells you there's this great package called, called Panda, and it has this function pandoc.table, which takes a table and returns a markdown representation of the table. You're like, great, I'll use that. You use it, and then you get out this, and you're like, well, that's slightly better, but it still doesn't look quite right. Um, and, and what we, what we need to add now, we need to tell our markdown with an option that we want the results of this chunk to be interpreted as is, as they are, i.e. Um, this chunk returns markdown, treat it as markdown. Uh, and then finally we get something that's slightly better, we're still not, um, sort of, look, it looks more like a table we might want in a document over one of the ones we saw before. Um, so chunks have options, and they, they are important. Um, the most common ones are shown on the screen here. So for example, um, we might set, decide to evaluate or not evaluate a chunk. Um, do we want the code to be shown in our, in our document? Are we making a, a report for ourselves or for a collaborator where we want them to see all the code and the outputs? Or is this a paper or a, uh, a document where we want to hide the code and just give the um, results? Warning and message, again, hide those. And the one we've already seen, do we want to hide the results? Do we want to output them as markdown? Um, have a read of the options here. Um, essentially trial and error, you'll, you'll sort of work out um, which one you need. Um, but these are important, they matter, and they define what our markdown is gonna do with each chunk. Um, you can set some defaults in your document, so maybe early on you might have some code like this, where we set the, by default, I want to hide the output, but you know, these stuff. we can set whichever options we want. So if I'm writing a paper, generally I'm hiding all the code, I'm hiding all the warning messages, I'm hiding everything except the markdown representation of, of the chunk. Um, and as I just said, you're, it's common to start a document with a sort of setup chunk where we load packages, we load data, and maybe define some options. Um, for example, here, I'm loading a library, I'm loading a data set, I'm saying, for every subsequent chunk, hide the output. Uh, and you can fiddle around with this and just put, be aware, chunks are a thing, these are what you want to use to put code in the document. They have options, and the options determine um, whether or not they're gonna get evaluated and what the output will be used for. Okay, figures, you just make figures and they are inserted in your document. I'm not gonna say anything else. A chunk that contains a figure also has some specific options that you might want to use. For example, uh, the width, the height, the, the caption, um, a few other things. But ultimately, if you know how to make figures in R, you now know how to make figures in our markdown. You create a code chunk, you put your figure in, and it will appear in your document. I'll say nothing more. Um, you can, of course, also insert figures that you've got from elsewhere. And for this, we use uh, uh, markdown syntax, which you're seeing on the screen here, um, exclamation mark, square brackets, caption, and then the path to the image. Uh, this is useful, obviously, if you've got external images, but it's also useful if your images, for whatever reason, take like 30 seconds to generate, 
and you don't want to wait every time you hit NIT for 30 seconds. So if you generate them once uh, and insert them um, using this syntax. Okay. Any, I've rambled through sort of these essentials of our markdown. There. Any, any questions so far? Um, obviously, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I have code that takes ages and ages to run. What do you normally do if you have something like that that normally you'd like to put it in a, in a block? Yeah. Uh, excellent question. Um, I'm definitely talking about this later, but I'll, I'll do a quick version now. Um, the, the short answer is you, you run it separately to your, your document. But that does raise the question of, well, I thought the whole point was reproducibility. So I've got a longer answer coming in a bit, and I'll cover it at the end. Um, but yeah, it's a good, good point. Anything else before I go into it? Yeah. Um, how do you deal with like, references and reference managers? Yeah, coming up. <laughs> um, can you put something to call it, call, kind of one other object? So, for example, you clean all your data in one object, yeah. you don't want that in your markdown, but you yeah. want it to run each time. Can you? Can you yep, call definitely. It um, yeah, so that's also coming up. This is great. Uh, it's almost like a planted question. Um, uh, you can either do it simply just by in your um, R markdown document, you could write source other R files. Um, but, and so that's fine for like simple things. So maybe you, um, you have a file that does all your data cleaning and so you source out at the top of your document. Um, I'm going to talk in a moment about make and make files, which I think is like the, the real answer to this. And it, handles and it answers the questions that come up. It handles dependencies much better. It is much smarter about knowing whether or not it needs to rerun all that analysis or whether or not the analysis is actually an up to date file. Um, so it maintains reproducibility but um, it isn't sort of brute force running everything every time. So yeah, I'll definitely put that. Anything else? Yeah. That's said, there'll be time at the end for um, other questions. Um, okay, so a few further things. What we just covered was sort of the essentials of a document. Um, and now we're just going to go in a bit more detail about what else you might want to know. Um, and you don't really need, to be honest, like all you need is to open our studio, click new document, and click knit, and start typing. Um, you, and then you can sort of add in things like citations and add in things like make files, whatever. As and when you have a need for it, don't feel the need to sort of learn all of our markdown in one go. You just start with the bare minimum that you need to get going. We've seen headers before, and up until now, they've been quite simple. We just had titles and an author and a date and so on. Um, and as we saw, our studio will do this for you when you create a new document. It will ask you to fill in some details and then it will populate this, this header. Uh, and that's fine, but sometimes, or later, you might want to add other things to your header. Um, there are loads of different options. I've just shown a few here, but for example, we might say I want a table of contents in my document. And so for that, we'd use this um, TOC, colon on true syntax to request it. I might want my sections to be numbered. I might want to apply a theme. Um, there, there are all sorts of different options. You don't need to worry about them until you need them. Um, and you, sort of start, you can start with a sort of simple header like this. Um, but this header block is where we define properties about our document, uh, and it's useful to know. Um, OK, so more complicated tables. Um, Pandoc.table that we saw earlier is, is fine. It's, um, it's from the Panda package and it, it's great at taking a simple table and converting it into a markdown table that will look not terrible in our document. Um, but we also need something more advanced, um, especially for sort of publication ready outputs. Um, we really need more control over the formatting, the layout, and all of the details. Um, if this is going to be reproducible, then we really need it to be um, have a complete pipeline from code to publishable output. Uh, and for a long time, this was really difficult. Um, in the last few years, things have been getting much better, particularly the two packages I'm going to focus on here. I'm going to say most about Flextable and very little about Cable Extra. So if you're using Microsoft Word, you want to use Flextable. If you're using uh, something else, and maybe if you use, and you have lots of time, look at this too. Um, <laughs> But, so, so I'll mostly be talking about Flextable, and what this is doing is it's syntax, it's a package, syntax for the writing tables that can be output into HTML, Word, and PowerPoint, um, while maintaining all of the sort of complexity of the formatting that we need for the tables. So what's great about these is that we can dynamically generate just about any table, uh, given time and patience. Um, what's not so great, the syntax can get complicated, and I'll show you in a second, the other slightly annoying thing is that the 
often you have to choose, am I going to make a Microsoft Word document or am I going to make a PDF document uh, via LaTeX? And the syntax that I'm going to use to make tables for each of those documents is different. And so I have to sort of choose one. Uh, and there, is some, there, are, there might be some solutions to that that I'll describe at the end. But uh, th this is, uh, yeah. So what does it look like? Uh, so flex table, uh, here a function. Same table as before. Um, hopefully you're somewhat familiar with the pipe. This is some um, syntax to just sort of carry on the, uh, take the output of this line and put it into the next line here. So take the table, apply the flex table function, apply auto fit, and then what we get is this table here. So this is screen grabs from Microsoft Word. Um, and you'll see that it's, it's, it's actually a table. It's not just some text and it's not HTML. Um, by default, it applied some, um, I guess, some formatting in that we have these lines, these border lines at the top and bottom. Um, it looks okay, uh, but we could probably do a lot better. Um, and so we, we start with that flex table function and then we go to the website and we get completely lost because you can spend a lot of time customizing um, your table every you like. So I'd, I'd go to the website, have a look at this quite a nice or map of like the main things that you might want to change. So we can see some themes in here. We can merge cells, we can apply styling, we can apply headers, we can control the borders, we can control the uh, formatting. Um, so much more detail on the website. Uh, for example, uh, we might want to change the uh, labels for our column headers. Um, we can do that with set header labels. And we just uh, give new, new headers and they appear here. Uh, we might want to make the heading bold for some reason. Um, we might want to use a terrible font that obscures the results entirely. And we might want to, for some reason, it aligns the numerical data on the center, which is, this is how to make a terrible table, but it's dynamic, so it's okay. Um, so we're using the align function here, and hopefully this syntax should read fairly, I think it's quite intuitive, it's aligned, it's saying what are we going to align, well the whole table, where are we going to align on the center, to set the font, um, I is rows and J is a column, so we're going to say set the font of these two columns to this font name here. Uh, it works, and that's what it is. Um, you can even set your format, formatting uh, conditionally. So here we're saying set the color for any row where year is equal to 2000 to red. Uh, and so now we have this monstrosity appearing. Um, but you can really, like, I've never really gone this far into conditional, but maybe sometimes this is useful. Um, this is useful, uh, merging vertically or, or, or horizontally. Um, uh, and so, for example, before we had uh, these repeated uh, country names, I just want those to appear once. And so I've used this or merge vertically command, and then I've told it which column do I want to merge on. Um, so that's, that's it, it works. Uh, and lastly, we might format, apply some uh, formatting to the numbers. Uh, and there are functions like uh, cold format num that have a whole bunch of options that control uh, how these two columns, in this case, are going to appear. And you can fiddle with that again all you like. The advantage of this that's important, I guess, is that you're not changing the underlying data. You don't have to generate a new column with commas in it. You can just use the original data, but format it for the table. So that's quite nice. Um, however, it does, it can, these tables can get quite involved. And so that's, this is all the code for that table that we just saw put together. Um, on the one hand, maybe this isn't so bad. It's, it's, it fits on one slide. Um, it's terrible, but um, uh, what I would say though is you can always write functions to automate common tables or common table formatting. Um, so we might have written we'll write a function that applies all of that terrible formatting to any table that we throw at it, uh, and then we can use that function over and over for different tables. Um, so um, yeah, and you, so you can sort of use as much or as little of this as you like, and you can automate it if you need. Okay, so that was FlexTable. Have a look at the website. Um, and, and as I said, start by just calling FlexTable and knitting and see what appears in Microsoft Word. And then look at some, and, and, you know, decide you want to change something, search the help file for borders, and then go from there. You don't need to sort of learn the syntax all at once. Uh, Cable Extra is another package I'm going to say very little about. It has um, similar functionality with different syntax. So here we start with um, a table. We apply cable, and then in this case, we've applied the function table styling. And this will give us, in HTML, a table looking like this. 
Um, you can really um, <laughs> go crazy with uh, formatting in, in, in this. I, some of this is ridiculous. Obviously, you don't want to rotate numbers. <laughs> but some of it is actually quite powerful. The ability to put in uh, sort of bars or, or, or some sort of um, sort of small graphs or graphics in the table is actually quite useful. Um, being able to conditionally color cells is, is quite nice. I've never found, apart from collaboration with, with colleagues on sort of preliminary analyses, I've never used this in, in anything real, as in publications or sort of uh, outward facing documents, but it's all possible. Uh, it also works with LaTeX, so here this is, this is generated by Cable Extra. Uh, main things to sort of highlight is that we've We've got um, multi-column cells, we've got uh, footers, uh, we've got group data, formatting, uh, captions, pretty much anything you can do in LaTeX, you can do with Cable Extra. Okay, so that's more advanced tables. Um, it's possible, they exist, there's two main packages to use, uh, and you can get started. Um, citations, we had a question earlier, these often, we, we need citations. Um, the short answer is, here is that Pandoc has them, so now, so do you. Um, our markdown is, is we're going to be using Pandoc, and therefore we're going to use Pandoc's support for citations. Um, the, the sort of one slide short version is we tell Pandoc where our references file is. In this case, I'm using a bibtex file, but you could also point it to an EndNote file. Um, we tell it what style we want. Uh, I'll say more about that in a second. And then we insert that citation into our document using this syntax here. So it's a square bracket, at sign, and then um, the bibtech key. Um, if you go to, um, I'm sure I said remember last time. Um, if you go to the, um, something called Zotero style repository, if anyone's used Zotero, you may already be familiar with this. This computer's slow. So maybe I'm submitting to trials, so I'm gonna search for trials. Um, I'll have a look at this one here. This looks about right. Uh, I'll then click this. It'll download it uh, down the bottom here, trials.csl, and then I will tell uh, our markdown that that's the file that I want, and then it will format my references to that style. So that's pretty much referencing in a nutshell. Um, more detail in the panel manual, and there's the link for the different styles that you might want. Um, yeah. Uh, diagrams. Um, I'll say not much at all about this. Um, this is definitely in that sort of risk of um, procrastination versus productivity. But sometimes you might have a need for automating diagrams. The diagram package uses other bits of software called GraphViz and Mermaid.js, which allow you to create graphics like this and pretty much many types of flowcharts, Gantt charts, um, anything on the screen here um, can be generated directly. The other thing I'd say is that anything um, that is plain text can be, so often um, for, uh, for trials, we need a consort diagram. And this consort diagram has loads of numbers and they all need to be updated quite often. So we can write that diagram in a, in a different editor, in a graphic editor, and save it as an SVG file. SVG is plain text, and therefore we can use R to update numbers in an SVG document. I, I can say more about that if you're interested at the end, but essentially anything that's plain text can be automated if you are interested. Um, diagrammer and, and graphics and mermaid are slightly nicer in places. Okay, in the interest of time, I'm going to um, be quick because um, otherwise we'll be here all day. So, make files. Um, so, the question came up earlier what if uh, I have something that's really slow or um, I want to split up my analysis into different scripts and different parts? Um, and I want to do this in a way that um, is reproducible. <laughs> Um, but also in a way that means I don't have to run everything all the time. So make files and the program make um, are, is, is technology used for software development when we have many dependencies when we need to comp compile a document. Um, in a typical analysis, we might have some raw data, we might have a script to do data cleaning, we might then save the clean data as a separate data file, we might have a script to fit some models, we might have some outputs and configures and eventually in our markdown document. And this is all fine until we then get some new data and our data changes, and now we need to rerun. Maybe, probably, I think the clean data's up to date, but I'm not sure, maybe I'll rerun it just in case. And then I think I ran the models, but they might be old now. Like, keeping track of all this stuff can get a bit difficult, and this is what make files can be used for. Um, there's a Wikipedia page, and there's a link here. I'll, I'll, say, I'll say more. So make is a, um, it's on your computer, maybe. 
you can use mapping limits on Windows, I think it can be made available. Um, that essentially, we're gonna, we're gonna write something called a make file, and this is a text file that defines its instructions on how to build our project. Um, we have targets and rules. So targets are the things we want to build. That might be clean data, it might be a uh, report, it might be a PDF, it might be a Word document. And then we write rules which are the commands needed to generate that. And that might be, as we'll see in a second, run this R script and that will generate this file. Or uh, run this R mark, or knit this R markdown document. Um, so when we run make, it will go through, make will go through the make file and for each dependency it will check, has it changed since last time we ran this, or do I need to update that dependency? If yes, it will, it will rerun the rules needed to make the dependency and then continue. And then finally, when everything's up to date, um, so for example, if we're just trying to make a figure, it will go back through this dependency tree and sort of check, is everything up to date before finally regenerating that figure? Um, so I'm, so this is what it looks like, this is a make file. Um, to use it, we would, for example, at the command line type make report, and it would figure out, so here we have, for example, here's a, here's a target, here's a clean data file, it depends on this raw.csv file. So when raw.csv changes and I run make, clean.rdata will be updated. It will know that the raw data has been changed, it knows it needs to update this, I don't have to check that. Uh, further down, we now have some sort of intermediary outputs that depend on the clean data. So if the clean data changes, this will be run. Uh, if the output's changed, then the report will be, and, and so on. And finally, the final target here is um, a PDF. That depends on the markdown document, and so on. And so when we type this, this will run as much of this as it needs to to ensure that everything's up to date. And it might just, when you, if you run it twice, for example, it will say, we're good, everything's up to date, I'm not doing anything else. If you changed the raw data, it would run everything. So this is a way of managing dependencies without you having to sort of think about it so much. Um, and it might be worth exploring. For simple documents, for many situations, this is completely unnecessary. But if you have a complex setup and many files and a long running project, it really can help. Okay, conclusions. I'm gonna try and do this in five minutes and then we'll hope to. Um, um, right. Not everything, <laughs> some things are still really hard. Um, the big one is that, I'm, like, for better or worse, track changes are really good. That's, I guess, part opinion and part um, reality. Like, we need some way of annotating a document that we can share with collaborators. Um, and I, I, I don't have a great answer. Um, what we would like is Google Docs raw markdown. We're in a Google Docs file. We have all our track changes and comments. We also have a knit button at the top. And now everyone can, add, can edit the same R markdown document. That doesn't exist yet. There are some things that are getting close, but nothing with the sort of support of Microsoft Word or, or Google Docs. So sometimes working with, um, if you're the person writing our markdown, you'll be generating a Word doc, you'll send that to collaborators, they'll send you a bunch, a bunch of track changes back. What do you do? Uh, what I do is essentially move over, like update the R markdown document with the changes that I need and, and reply to comments. But, that is not an ideal scenario. There, there is a better future somewhere away. Um, yeah, yeah, so can we all just use gear? I actually don't think that'd be a solution. I think it was, it's, it's great, and I'll say more about that in a second, but um, even if all of your collaborators use gear and everyone was just pushing and, and pulling from some central repository and um, you still are not quite at the sort of, I would say, usability of um, track changes and comments in the off a bit more intuitive. So that's still hard. Um, the last 5%, what I mean by this is we get 95% of the way to the finished product, but for whatever reason, I need to then go and manually edit by hand. And as soon as you've done that, you've broken that, you've broken that sort of um, flow of, of reproducibility, because now when you hit knit or compile or whatever it is, you won't get to the sort of final, um, that last report that you want. Um, this is getting much better with things like Flextable because they allow you to um, construct or publish, or publishable finished tables that don't require manual editing. So that's great. We're still not there. Journal submissions, you're still going to be editing by hand a lot. Like, wouldn't it be nice if we could just upload an R RMD? I mean, 
given if, if those data is open, upload your ARMD documents, upload your data, and they can deal with the formatting however they like. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, and I've mentioned this before, cross-format output. So sometimes the syntax for a PDF differs from the syntax for a Word document. Um, have a look at this link if you're interested. There, there are some sort of, there might be ways around this, but currently that is the case in knowing. I need to make a decision. Is this going to be a PDF or a Word document? Okay, general tips in, in one and a half minutes. Um, this has already come up, but don't rerun your analysis every time. Don't put your entire analysis into a single R markdown document that every time you hit NIT, it's cleaning data, running the analysis, and doing the report. Save it, save the results in intermediate objects, and ideally, use make to manage those dependencies. Or if not make, use some like, other R script that is called by your R markdown document and will update things as and when they need. So for example, um, we might have a, something that takes forever to run. We will uh, run the model and then save this as a sort of binary object estimates to our data, and then we can load that later on in our, um, in our R markdown document. Use Git for version control. I think we had Git um, recently, but um, I don't know how you would do this without Git, quite honestly. Like you, you're making lots of changes to a quite complex document that need, I don't know. I use Git, and I, I, I would recommend if you sort of go too far down R markdown, you probably want to try it. Uh, themes, reference doc documents, and templates. These are all three separate things. Themes are changing what it looks like. Uh, CSS, mostly, so for HTML output, we're going to use themes. Reference doc documents are really useful. These are for Microsoft Word, and you, what they allow you to do is to knit your document, get a Word document out, then edit the styles in that document. So you might want the bold headers, different fonts, whatever you like, completely customize that, that uh, Word document, and then use that as a reference document for subsequent uh, time when you knit your R markdown document, and all of the styles will be retained. So you can set double spacing, you can change the page layout, you can pretty much anything you, anything you can change inside a Word document will be retained.